What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. You know what we're doing. Every single week, we're having real talk in the corporate world. We center and amplify black and brown folks at work. Um, we're just having, you know, authentic conversations. And who we talk to? We talk to all kinds of folks, right? Like some weeks we might have Jay Prince on. I mean, that one time gets he scared the mess out of me. I, I, he probably won't come back. Um, and then we had um, the CEO of Survey Monkey on. And then we'll have like, you know, an elected official on or two or three. And then we'll have um, a couple of activists on, right? Shout out to Ray McKesson. Shout out to Zelly. Shout out to Charles Preston. You know, shout out to um, who else we have on uh, authors, right? So shout out to Feminista Jones, Howard Bryant. I will have, uh, you know, educators on, professors. Shout out to Caitlin Rosenthal, Dr. Robert D'Angelo. Uh, shout out to Dr. Courtney McClooney, Dr. Aaron Thomas, Dr. Tima Okun. You know, and we have and we've also had like political commentators on. Right. So we've had Dr. Jason uh, Johnson. on. So what's up, Dr. Johnson? What's up? Uh, listen, man, uh, hit me back. I definitely want to have you back. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I appreciate you. I feel like we had a really good conversation. And, you know, we're having like we're continuing forward. You know, we're continuing to have these conversations. We continue to live in a uh, in this world. Right. And so, you know, living corporate is not necessarily like a politics media network. Like, you know, we really center and amplify black and brown experiences at work. But it would be intellectually and emotionally inauthentic to say that politics don't impact black and brown people at work. And so I'm really excited about the guest we have today. Founder of Black Women Views Media, Reese Colbert. Reese, what's going on? How you doing? Hey, Zach, I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on your show. Yo, thank you for being on. You know, I'm gonna be honest with you. So like, you know, I, I'm kind of like I'm in this media space and, you know, we've been around for two and a half years. And we've had like a lot of dope people on and I still get kind of starstruck. So, like when you followed me on Twitter, I was like, what is I was I was very I was very like I was I was shocked I was shook up. Oh, like, you're too kind. <laughs> no, 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 I love I love your work. Um, I, you know, I'm saying I check you out on uh, on Roland Martin's on his show, and I just I've mm-hmm. always appreciated your takes. Um, recently, you've um, you know you've had to you've had to set uh, Michael Harriet straight a couple times on these Twitter streets. <laughs> to- I'm blocked now, so I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> It is I no, always ruffling somebody's feathers. No, sh- mean, it, hey, no, no, no. It's, it's all good. I mean, look, it's needed. I think you know this is no shade to Michael here. Like I, I love both of y'all. Like I'm not even trying to like place like play it in the middle. Like I really enjoy right. y'all both. I think honestly, I think honestly, I've always enjoyed Michael Harriet's threads and his content, and I've never actually looked at him with a critical eye before. I yeah. Looked, before before I looked at your tweets though. And I was like, yeah. I was like, well, let me, hmm, maybe I should challenge this. And it really yeah. kind of brings me to like my first thing I want to talk about, which is not ignoring and really centering the perspectives of black women in all spaces, including mm-hmm. the political space. I'd love to hear more about, you know, your journey um, as a political commentator and how uh, black women views media got started. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for me, black women views media started as what I saw was this 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 space that was missing for black women to be unapologetically multifaceted. You know, so many times there are these litmus tests for this is a woke litmus test. This is a intelligence litmus test and things of that nature. And I just felt like there there should be a space for a black woman that can be anything at any given time. You know, I like love and hip hop. I like basketball wives. I love, um, you know, Real Housewives of Atlanta and Potomac. But I also like uh, The Readout and Rachel Maddow. And I'm a political junkie. And so I and I cuss a lot. I curse like a sailor, you know. So it's like one of those things where I'm like, (laughs) I absolutely refuse to be boxed in by anybody's notion of what black womanhood is, what uh, respectability is, what intelligence is. And so I said, well, if I lead with my voice, people that are attracted to that, people that gravitate towards that will come. Um, And uh, people that don't like it don't care. But that was kind of the impetus of me creating black woman views was just saying, hey, there's a space for a woman like me, a woman that aren't, uh, you know, super on their high horse about everything, you know, and and so that's really where I wanted to come in. And I'm really happy that I created it at a time I actually created it. I want to say, I don't remember now, I think I'm going to say 2018 is when I first started it. And I started off primarily on Instagram. And uh, so I was really, really, um, you know, pushing uh, the midterms and things of that nature. And uh, I'm really happy that I started it then because it gave me a chance to really kind of come into my voice on the social media landscape before I even got to Twitter. And, um, you know, I felt like 
during the the presidential primary, especially, I, I felt let down by a lot of black influencers or you know um, intelligentsia and these these um, these political pundits that many of us, including myself, have come to kind of revere as you know thought leaders for our community. And I just felt like they switched up or their their energy wasn't consistent with what we had been seeing with them for years in particular as it relates to Senator Kamala Harris. And so that's where I really um, was like, wait a second, something ain't adding up here. And that's where that critical part came in where I, I, I was like, listen, um, I'm going to be, you know, brutally honest about things that I don't like, things that, that just seem off to me, things that seem inconsistent. But I'm also going to be... Um, unapologetic and fiercely um, devoted to amplifying Senator Kamala Harris and, and, and fighting for a black woman because she deserved it. And, and I think now people are starting to see it now that she's, you know, we, everybody loves a winner, but, um, but you got to have people to help you get to that space where you're winning and not a lot of people are willing to step out. And so I'm glad that I came along in that space. There's a part of me that will always be disappointed that there was that much space for somebody like me who was very small account. Right. I think I had like 200 something followers on Twitter. Um, when I started, you know, really going hard for Kamala, I had more people on Instagram, but now I'm at 70,000 right. uh, followers on Twitter. And the only reason for that is because p other people left that space wide open. Um, so that, that's where we are today. I'm, I'm on Roland Martin unfiltered on Thursdays. Um, and I do a couple other little things here and there too. First of all, thank you for your courage. Right. And I think, you know, your your story and the work that you're doing right now follows the meta narrative of black women having to carry and support every doggone body because in saving themselves, they end up saving us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. your labor. And uh, and shout out to Roland Martin as well. You know, now Roland's going to hear this, uh, hopefully. And, you know, listen, Reese, when you see Roland, you let him know that I've been emailing him. OK, oh, I mean, a, a couple other people. I'm, and I'm not going to name drop who the other people are who've been trying to get Roland. They hit me back. Uh -huh. just, just you know please let him know i'm looking for him you know what i'm saying i got okay. love for him. i'm trying to get him you know what i'm saying trying to hang out with him anyway it's not about yeah i love this, rolling i love rolling too this is not about rolling this is about you and i having this conversation right now now look but can i say though shout out to rolling because you know i i i make a joke that i'm like the loud mouth black girl on twitter and not a lot of people a lot of people know me to be like kind of like an expert on kamala um and uh you know i'm a, i do politics outside of just talking about kamala sure but he really was the first one to really step up and give me a chance outside of my own platform, which I was fine with, to be clear, with having my own platform. Of course. Uh, but I, I appreciate that he that he really took a chance on me um, and and really believed in my voice. And I've been on Roland um, now for uh, going on 10 months straight. Every Thursday, I've been on Roland Martin. So shout out to Roland. Yo, shout out to Roland. And no, it's I'm serious. That's the thing I like. More than his political acumen, I appreciate that Roland is about the people, right? Like he will actually yeah. engage. He's not like Hollywood. And that's what I've been, you know, realizing what we're going to get to in a second is just this black elitism is, um, mm -hmm. it's exhausting. It's exhausting. Like to, to kind of engage. And then, you know, folks, when they make an assumption, they think you're Hollywood and then you say something that they don't intend, they don't expect whatever. And then they kind of put that little whatever on you too. So it's just, mm, I don't know. It's, just, yeah. it's disappointing. Anyway. So now, uh, to to this week, right? We're recording this on the fourth of October, in uh, the year of our Beyonce, twenty twenty, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Trump has, you know, you know, as the news reports say, he got the Rona, right? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out, you know, how have you been navigating, um, you know, if as much as you're comfortable, your own emotional. Uh, space with that and then also like these Twitter streets so let me just like level six I'm not trying to lead you into nothing right so let me just talk about what I've been seeing so right on Twitter I've been seeing some black celebrities uh, notable ones um, mm -hmm. say things like you know we wish you well and you know I'm not wishing death on anybody and you know we gotta we gotta you know you see you see Rachel Maddow I think just the other day was like you know think about our friends who you know your friend who just you know who, who got lung cancer after smoking cigarettes you still want the best for them while also, you know, holding them accountable for their actions, both these things exist at the same time, and mm -hmm. there's like this appeal to respectability and decency <laughs> and civility, and I'm, I'm not. So I don't wish death on anybody. Like to be clear, right? right? That's of course not. not. And and I, and I think I think it's intellectually dishonest to say that if you're not desperately pleading for someone to be healthy, that you're wishing them to you're, you're wishing their demise. I, I don't think I don't think one equals the other. 
Uh, right. And I'm seeing like a lot of critique on that. Right. Um, and I'm just curious to know, like, as much as you're comfortable sharing, like, what has it been like this week for you, you know, starting at the debate to all these various reports and kind of like conflicting information around um, the current occupiers of the white occupier of the White House's health? Like, what has it been like mm-hmm. for you to navigate this just as a political commentator? Well, I'm always unbossed and unfiltered, so I keep it real. And I think a lot of people have been on their high horse. And, you know, there's a lot of pick me going on. Pick me, pick me. I'm so righteous. And I don't give a damn about being righteous, okay? Like, at the end of the day, let's be honest. I think Saturday Night Live said it best. What if science and karma could team up, you know? And I I mean, I don't, I, and I also think, like you said, it's, dis, it's intellectually dishonest to suggest that because somebody isn't, you know, crying a river or playing a tiny violin for Donald Trump that they're wishing death on him. I don't want that karma on myself. I, I'm not I'm not trying to say, hey, um, you know, drop dead or anything like I that. Don't that I, don't, I don't want that energy. I'm good on it. I don't want that. Mm-hmm. I ain't got time for that. I don't need that kind of karma on my head. So but what I will say is let's keep the same energy that he had for other people. He's the one who said it is what it is. Okay. He's the one that has completely abdicated his responsibility to have a robust federal response. He told states to fend for themselves. We have a death toll of what is it now? 208, 209,000 dead Americans. Yeah, almost 200,000. Yeah. Right. 7.3, I think 7.3, 7.4 million, million. Americans yeah. infected. Yeah. The, we're, we're hitting the highest numbers of daily uh, COVID numbers since mid-August at 55,000, I think was yesterday. Mm -hmm. So this is a crisis of Donald Trump's own making. It was inevitable that he was going to basically get burned by him playing with fire. So I'm not at all conflicted about it. Um, Now, what I am conflicted about is the fact that we have no idea what's really going on. You know, a lot of people were on the high horse about people, you know, being skeptical about him having COVID at all. I don't blame people for being a little cynical because Donald Trump is a pathological liar. Um, But I'm more on the side that he does have it because he's been completely irresponsible. But what I'm conflicted about is what the hell is going on? Is he really severe and they're trying to downplay it? Or is he not severe and they're trying to, like, for instance, you know, came out today that he's on three different drugs, two of those drugs, which are normally reserved for people who are severe. And so there's the cynical part of me that's like, is he really even sick? And they're just, you know, this is a ploy for him to come out and say, look, I've taken all these miracle drugs like he did with hydroxychloroquine or however you say that. You know, he's he's always touting these miracle cures. And so there's a part of me that's cynical that's like, well, I don't, you know, maybe if they're saying he's in good shape, but he's on these drugs for severe people, maybe he's not really on those drugs. Maybe this is Mm. just a ploy for him to come out and say, look at all these great treatments that we have. Coronavirus is under control. You know, I don't know. So that's what I really don't know. We know for sure that they lie and that we know for sure that they've lied about his symptoms on, you know, on various days. And so I don't know what to believe in terms of the severity of his diagnosis. But what's very clear is that he um, is a super spreader and that he knew he was infected or he knew that there was a chance of him being infected. And he still went on because perhaps he thinks because he's a narcissist and he doesn't care about people. Well, if I got it, then who cares who else gets it? My whole goal And a lot of people, I think particularly Trump supporters with their refusal to wear a mask, uh, you know, psychoness is that they feel like, well, if I get it, then that's all I care about. All I care about is not getting it. I don't care about me not giving it to you. I only care about you not giving it to me. So that tracks why he would continue to be out and about doing fundraisers and rallies and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, I, I just think I, but I think it's, it's insane that we're in a political landscape where the white house is having an outbreak. You don't see, uh, this, this whole all hands on deck, everybody wear masks, you know, let's do contract tracing. Let's do mass quarantining. They're just going on. Like it's almost business as normal with not just the white house, but the Republican party. And it's really, really disturbing, but I think it's, I think it's going to do real damage to his electoral chances because, the survey came out today, 65% of Americans believe that 
he could have prevented it by taking it more seriously. So I don't think this is going to be a net positive for him. If, if it was a stud, I think it's going to backfire spectacularly on him. Well, you know, I, and we're kind of working backwards now. You're talking about just things failing. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the presidential debate. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and then I want to talk about, you know, because I do want to get into Kamala and I want to talk about, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I would be remiss not to for us not to engage that. But let's talk about this presidential debate first. Um, so on a scale of um, let's see here, absolute trash and dumpster <laughs> fire. Where would you rank that performance? I think it was a dumpster fire. Okay. It was a disgrace. It was an abomination. <laughs> It was. It was the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I was so taken aback. I was live tweeting. I think you were live tweeting also uh, during the debate. And I was just like, I was like, oh my gosh, like this isn't, this is insane. I can't, I mean, and it's, 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 it would be wrong for me to say, I can't believe Donald Trump would behave this way, but it was just so beyond the pale. And I think, you know, when you talk through, I think this, this, this season, like this presidency, my wife and I talk about this a lot is that there's a certain level of gentility that we um, just, we expect the office of the presidency to have, right? It mm-hmm. like irrespective of the imperialistic nature of America and like the things that right. we do abroad, we expect for you yeah. not to, you know, do the act, act about You have to have decorum. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, some sense of decorum when you in front of everybody. And so right. he was barking on Chris Wallace. He was over talking on Biden. It just didn't mm-hmm. make any sense to me. I'm, I'm curious as to like, you know, where do you fall as it pertains? To, and again, this this has this presumes that uh, Donald Trump uh, does recover or is or is sick and does recover and is in a position to continue forward with the debates. Do you like do you think that we should continue to have these? Like, you know, there are people who say, like, we should have them, but with like with different rules. Like, what is your position on that? I don't think there should be any more debates. I, I, I just I don't I mean, I, I know that people really want to see Kamala annihilate uh, um, Mike Pence, which I believe she will do. I don't particularly want to see that happen in person because I'm not, I don't trust that Mike Pence is truly negative. I think that as long as he's asymptomatic, they'll say that he's negative. Um, Mm -hmm. So I don't really trust that. But um, as far as uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, there's zero reason for them to debate again. These, These debates don't particularly move the needle too much to the extent that polling has shown it's moving the needle, it's actually in Biden's favor. But um, I, I don't, I don't think that Biden will be particularly well served by another debate with Trump on his best behavior because I don't think that Biden really did that good of a job. I think he did an okay job, um, particularly under the circumstances of being just completely bullied and uh, and just trampled over for ninety minutes. That has to be incredibly unnerving. And a difficult um, to to just even live through. Uh, so you know, I, but I but I don't think substantive we we learned anything out of that debate. Um, and so it's just it's just an embarrassment. It's a national embarrassment. And also now we know that very likely Donald Trump was already infected with COVID. Um, that could be why he showed up late to, and him and his family showed up late. So that they didn't have to get tested in time. So, you know, there's that sinister insidious part of Donald Trump just being irresponsible. Uh, the next debate, I believe, is scheduled for the 15th. And so, you know, technically that would be out of the 14 day window. Maybe it might be just one day out of the 14 day window. Uh, but I, I just say cancel it. Let's move on as a country. There's voting in 35 states already. Three million votes were cast as of Friday. The election is already now. Let's just move on. Honestly, let me see where part that I that I've had I came to the same conclusion during that debate. Let me see here. Okay, when Biden said, "Will you just shut up, man?" I said, oh, "Okay, we don't need to do this again." Yeah. Like, I mean, what? What? Why? Well, yeah. What? I mean, I think I think Biden was. I, I you know I think you know he was accurate. He was saying what we all thought. I think he could deliver a little bit more forceful when he was given to getting those digs in. But I honestly think that Trump did come in there with the intentions of being a bully. Oh, but yeah. I don't think his game plan was to go that far. I think what happened was he saw that he was really unnerving Biden. And he so he's like a shark 
that, that had that smell, smell that blood. blood in the water. Mm-hmm. And he just, at that point, he just was an unhinged maniac. He could not resist because his more, he was not focused on the task at hand, which is to convince the American electorate that he deserves another four years. He was solely convinced on just messing with Biden. And so I, I really don't believe that 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 was the game plan going. I just think that he just has no self-control and that's, and he just got a kick out of doing that. Um, but yeah, but I don't think that, um, I think that Biden was very restrained oh, in the yeah. stuff that he said. I think he was restrained in the tone that oh, he yeah. used. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more force, but it, it is what it is with that. Well, no, I'm right there with you. And I think, and you're absolutely right. At Trump's big age, it's, it's wild how he can't control himself at all. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't understand I just don't I don't get that at all. Uh, yeah. and I, he, he, it continues to blow my mind to your point around Biden. You know, I was talking to a mentor of mine. We were watching it in real time. It's like, you know, he was kind of and he, you know, his point was he's like, look, you know, he's like Biden continuing to like react is a fail. Like he needs to. And I was like, well, I said, the thing about it is it's not him reacting. Isn't the reactions aren't bad. Like him reacting no. is not bad. It's the it's just that he's not he's not Kamala Harris where he gonna snap like he doesn't know how to snap back right so it's kind of yeah. he, he kind of was like oh well no that's not true that's not true like nah like like because he's and, and i think also you know at the <laughs> trump has failed so much right he's done mm-hmm. so much wrong it's almost like there's too much to hit it's like it's like there's so many options i can understand you being flustered i can certainly empathize with being flustered in the moment it's kind of like when somebody talking to you you know, this is so I'm kind of going back to high school, but so like, you know, certain po- f- folks in school is like, I know you're not talking, but like some of them people, I know you're not talking. People have so much going on. It's like, dang, okay, how do I do? I talk about your shoes? Like, do I talk about your haircut? Do I talk about your nails being dirty? Do I talk about your teeth? Do I talk about you failing? Like, yeah, classes? like you don't know what to do because it's and then, but they, but they just screaming. So you're like, dang, okay, uh, 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 you kind of just end up kind of you know on the defensive. I I, I get that. Um, but it yeah. was it was interesting to me. You know, I think to your point around like there couldn't have been his game plan when he's when he when he talked about when he talked about biden's kids i was like mm, just deplorable disgusting and i was i was like come on man i mean i mean like don't do that. yeah come on let's not i think that was the moment for me where i was like we don't need to do this when he said i don't know bo uh, i don't I know, know bo. Hunter I'm and about Hunter Hunter that was it for me. I said, we don't need to do this. Said, this, this does not do this anymore. And, yeah. I, and this is when I actually, to like straight up to your point about restraint, is that's when I realized how, how mature Joe Biden is. Because yeah. I've been like, I know you're not talking about my kids. I'm looking at your kids right over here. I yeah. I see their red I eyes know. from here. I know you're not talking. Come, come on. Let's, yeah. um, let's don't play. And, and he literally said, hey, this isn't about either one of our families. This is about the American people. I was like, wow, that was a very controlled line like yeah you i think it did a good job not making it a slug fest because you can't roll around with pigs you know oh yeah so yeah I, I think he showed remarkable restraint i just think he was more flustered to use your word uh than i think any of us would have liked to have seen but it's understandable why he was flustered absolutely i think i also think to your point like there were some things there was there were several things that he could have hit on right i think like i think i tweeted about this and a bunch of other folks commented after the fact uh, Barry Williams said something as well, but like just on like, you know, when he said, you know, but he downplayed man. It's like, dog, Herman Cain died after going to one of your, yeah. you know, like, you know, there was mm-hmm. a, a lot of stuff going on. Okay. But so, so I, I, again, I want to talk about, get your perspective on the debates. I hear you. I agree that frankly, there's just no real reason for us to continue. I think that if, you know, as it pertains to, to those options, there are a lot of folks who are saying they're un- they're unsure, but I just like I feel like you pretty much know. Yeah, I could be wrong, right? But I think the majority of folks know who they're voting for, even if they get on spaces and they say they don't. I think deep down, folks know who they're going to vote for. Now, I am curious about this uh, VP debate, though. Mm-hmm. So now, are you looking forward to this? I am not, only because I'm very concerned about the health um, and safety of Senator Kamala Harris. Again, I do not trust the. Um, the Trump administration, the Trump campaign to follow health protocols, to be honest about uh, anybody. And it's not just Mike Pence who could be affected. It could literally be anybody be that anybody. they send um, to that to that particular debate. I like what Jamie Harrison did yesterday in South Carolina when he brought his plexiglass. Like, come I res- on. I respect it. I love it. Yeah, that was that was gangster. So, like, you know, but let's take out the doom and gloom scenario of it being a, a, a safety risk, a COVID health risk 
Um, I am looking forward to the country seeing the Senator Kamala Harris that I admire, the one who is a complete badass, who has represented time and time again. And, um, you know, one of the things that she is unmatched on is uh, dismantling the Trump administration's COVID response. I don't know if you saw her pre-rebuttal to Trump's um, RNC speech, where yes. she just went for 20 minutes and just completely eviscerated their response. That is what needs to happen on uh, Wednesday. And nobody can deliver that more forcefully than her. So that's what I'm looking forward to. You know, I, I'm right there with you. I don't know. I, I don't see a point in you know, a debate being face to face. I would like to say, you know, and again, this partially just due to, you know, I think just human beings are predispositioned to, to carnage. I do want to see Kamala Harris, Jack up Mike Pence. I want to be, I do. I want to see <laughs> yeah. Him. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You know, you know, he said something, he said something like about a month or so ago, he said kind of alluding to, he said, you know, well, we'll, we'll you know, I welcome her. I'm, I'm looking forward to the debate. I'm like, what are, what are you looking forward to? You should, yeah. be, you shouldn't be looking forward to that at all. Yeah, said, said something about protecting our meat. I was just like, I don't, I don't think you're not good at this part. Like whatever this is for you, like you're not good at the, the communications piece, Mike Pence. Like you should stop, stop this. And so, you know, I'm I'm curious about you know what that's going to look like, and I'm curious about how she shows up. I am curious to get your perspective on, you know, the rebuttals and just kind of like the critiques on Kamala Harris has you know since she's began running around the fact that. Folks say she's police and that she's, you know, she's been locking black folks up and she's pro police and all these different things like regarding her record and how uh, lopsided it, it it has been historically in terms of the fact that you just never heard that level of vitriol or critique towards Amy Klobuchar, even though, I mean, Amy Klobuchar has done has a terrible record as it pertains to black yeah. folks. I'm curious to get your perspective on like. You know, as you think about Kamala Harris and her history as a prosecutor, um, her some some of the statements that she's made in the past, um, like not how you've reconciled it, but just what's your what is your rebuttal to those who have, you know, those critiques about her in general? People have plenty of things to critique, but in summary, most folks just kind of summarize it as Kamala Harris po is police. So, like, what is your like what is your like your thoughts or your response to to those types of critiques? Um, well, we're budding. That is completely my specialty. Um, you know, Amy Klobuchar is who they said Kamala Harris was, right, in terms of her record. Right. right. Uh, it is completely, completely false um, that any notion that Kamala Harris was some sort of um, draconian prosecutor or person who was a persecutor is almost what I've heard somebody even refer to her as. That's completely absurd. Senator Kamala Harris um, is a trailblazer. She is she is a really um, a trailblazer in terms of progressive uh, prosecutors. That's just that's just unequivocally a fact, you know. And so my first response is that number one, Senator Kamala Harris has been the target of a massive disinformation misinformation campaign since 2017. And so what happened is she was not only just targeted by by uh, bots and inauthentic accounts and disinformation, misinformation, but she was also targeted by the Bernie Sanders left wing media outlets like Jacobin and The Intercept. You had, for instance, Breonna Gray Joy, who was writing hit pieces about Kamala Harris in the primaries before she signed on to be Bernie Sanders press secretary. Do you think that those pieces were updated to reflect that she's actually the press secretary for an opponent of Kamala Harris? Absolutely not. And so this is something that has been by design that people um, feel these feel this way about Kamala Harris. Uh, and I, one of the things that I say is that it's very easy to convince people of a sensational lie than a simple truth. The simple truth is that you cannot cure centuries of, uh, of, of racism, systemic racism. You cannot cure the, the problems that are created by laws when your job is to enforce the laws. But let's just be clear of what Senator Kamala Harris did as district attorney 
She created the first in the nation reentry program that reduced recidivism by 60 percent of its participants. That was a program for black and brown men and women and ages. I believe it was it was like young adults. Let's just say young adults, 18 to 34. And that was at a time where you could get 20 years in prison. This was in 2004, 20 years in prison for two grams of crack. And that was something that she had to get funding for. She had to work her Rolodex and they called her program Hug a Thug and Back on Crack. So all these Twitter influencers and all these Twitter activists, where the hell were y'all at back in 2004? They were nowhere to be found. Okay. And so she was actually doing the work. When you have skin in the game, yeah, you get some bruises. Some people went to jail. Okay, that's just how that works. We have a, a carceral system in this country where when you do a crime and you're convicted of that crime, you go to jail. Did some people that were innocent go to jail? Possibly. But people would like you to believe that everybody in jail is innocent or only people in jail are in jail for weed. They want to ignore the people that are raping people and killing people and, and knocking people upside their heads and breaking into people's homes. All None of that happened. It was just only weed smokers that went to jail. And let me tell you, as a person who was in California at that time, who was raised in California, I never saw a stressed out pothead. Never. I never saw a pothead. I was like, oh my God, Kamala Harris is coming to get me. I better throw this weed out. Like literally, it's a, the way that they, the way that they really create this picture of the way that marijuana it's just smokers were attacked under Kamala is so absurd I've never I, I would I would challenge anybody show me a stressed out pothead in 2004 <laughs> I was about show to me say, somebody in 2010 I was like oh my god Kamala's coming to get I me will, I, I will say I will say there is there there is this narrative of like and this this picture painted around Kamala Harris like she was running around here with like her dogs and, and, and yeah. like chains to just like throw random black people in jail. I was like, I just it's I, ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. and there's a, and then and then you got the whole you got the whole um, ADOS crowd who's like, you know, chaos agents. Mm -hmm. chaos That's agents. a disinformation, misinformation, black voter suppression campaign. It was in the Mueller report that one of the most. Uh, most um, effective ways that they sought to suppress the black vote was through race and racism. That's what Senator Kamala Harris said. And everybody was all, ah, she's being ridiculous. No, it's actually documented in the Mueller report. And so that's one of the actual number one attacks from Senator Kamala Harris after, particularly after the debate, the first debate where she was subject to a hundred and I want to say 81,795, something those that's the ballpark. 93% of all of the attacks for all of the candidates were against Kamala Harris. Out of 200,000, she got 93% of all of the attacks. Not just her attacks, but of, including Joe Biden, he was number one, Bernie Sanders, number two, Elizabeth Warren, number three, and so on and so forth. But Kamala Harris singularly got the most attacks. So, and, and then when you look at, and there is data to support this, you can Google it. The number one way that she was attacked was not on policy, even though on Twitter, oh, Medicare for all, blah, blah, blah. It was on matters of character and identity, particularly her race. And that's the first thing that you saw flare up after she was uh, announced she's not really black and this, that, and the other. So that is where the ADOS piece comes in. I'm not saying that there aren't people in a who are ADOS who legitimately want reparations and want the ADOS yeah, yeah, agenda, yeah. but in terms of the leadership and in terms of the social media, again, like I said, disinformation, misinformation campaign, it was almost solely targeted at uh, Kamala Harris because they knew if she got the black vote, she would be the nominee. And now they know that if Biden and Harris get the black vote in record numbers, they will be president and vice president. It, it really leads me into the thing that the the thing I want to talk about before we get up out of here, which is, you know, I started off talking about I brought Mike here. You said he blocked you. Um, I, I think I did see that, but because <laughs> <laughs> I saw. So hold on. So because this is going somewhere. So when you was it that exchange about the Kamala Harris interview and how like he didn't drop it in time. And so I'm trying to figure out like one. Why is it that even in I do believe still, and I think this is not a this is not a debatable point, is that black women continue to be 
mistreated, undermined, mm-hmm. ignored. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out like, you know, what are ways you believe that we as non-black women in these mm-hmm. spaces, like in these working spaces, political spaces, in just these American spa- in these spaces can better center and amplify and like listen to y'all like you know i'd I'd love to just get your perspective on that there's folks who listen to this who are not black women there are Mm -hmm. aspirational allies who listen to this um but when i saw um your tweet then i saw him retweet it with your with with your comment then i saw you tweet back and then yeah then you got blocked i was like you know what this is this is more of the same. And like, again, this is not a critique on Michael Harriet, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't highly, I don't know. I don't know either one of y'all. It was more just like, right, a, right, right. it was just more of like, but it highlighted something to me because I follow both of y'all. And so I was kind of like, yeah. I was like, dang, even I said, y'all even beefing up here. Like, and not y'all, but you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, so you know, oh, so yeah. black women, I listen to being heard up here. And so I just love yeah. to get your perspective. If you want to talk about this situation specifically, that's great. I just want to get your perspective on, on that. Like, what are ways that we can show up and be better? for y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think that's an interesting take on that. Um, you know, I am unapologetically for a black woman. Sometimes that means, you know, going at other black women. Cause if you're not for a black woman and you're a black woman, I ain't got nothing for you. Uh, that's why I say plenty of times I support black women who support black women. Um, yeah. and some people have said, Oh, you support black women, but you drag black women. Uh, I drag black women that don't support black women. Be clear. I'm not dragging you when you're supporting black women. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, but I, I think what's interesting is that, and this has been my experience. I'll talk about my experience. I think that people are so unaccustomed to a black woman being fiercely and unapologetically protected in the way that I, um, ride for Kamala Harris. Right. And, and it's so foreign to them. It's not a profit making venture for me. I don't make my money through social media at all. I've never solicited money through social media except for to get donations for Senator Kamala Harris and then now for the Biden Harris campaign. And so um, I, I think that people are very, very, very unaccustomed to that. And so it comes across very jarring to them. And I think that's what was jarring to Michael Harriet. And I think he blocked me because somebody said, oh, you should apologize. And I said, I absolutely will not be doing that Definitely not. because no. um, I was accurate in what I said. I mean, he has a, he has a history of being shady towards Colin. Okay. And so I just call it out. Listen, if you're not being shady, then you can say, you know, well, I, I was busy, whatever. Okay, fine. I, it didn't matter. It really, I, at that point, I didn't care. I mean, Chadwick Boseman had died for Christ's sake, so I didn't even care what right, they right, were right, right, right. talking about. So he was the one who was still upset about it. I didn't, I moved <laughs> on. Um, but I think that um, I would say check yourself. You yeah. know, don't be so jarred by a black woman or anybody protecting another black woman. That is just something that people are not used to. And I think that that creates a discomfort for people. And so that's one. Um, Number two, uh, you know, just give us the same grace that you would give a white woman. Like, for instance, the grace that Elizabeth Warren was extended. Oh, my gosh. Any Mm -hmm. little thing she did, everybody was all, you know, fainting and wooing and ooing and eyeing over that. I wouldn't say everybody. Let me just say the intelligentsia, the black (laughs) uh, blue check class and things like that, which they don't like me saying that, but I don't care. But, yeah, I'm just, you know, why do you have to interrogate and dismantle and disassemble everything a black woman does? But when it comes to that white gaze. You know, oh, you just so flattered that somebody patted your little black self on the head and told you you were smart and you was important. And so that's another thing I would say. But I just think like, hey, you know, give people space. This is my thing. There is space for Michael Harry and for me. I've never told anybody don't follow him or don't like him. A, no. a lot of people give me the feedback. I like both y'all. OK, that's fine. You can like both of us. We have different perspectives. Yeah. And so, um, you know, make space for multiple perspectives and you don't have to agree with everything anybody says. You don't have to like everything everybody says. But, you know, if you don't keep it moving, you know, if you do like it or I mean, don't keep it moving, say what you got to say and then keep it moving. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I just I just think that, um, you know, people just need to just check themselves. That's really what it boils down to. Check yourself. Are you really? walking the walk or are you just talking the talk about you protecting black women and you supporting a black woman and listen black woman and hashtag this and hashtag that but you don't keep that same energy when somebody says something that you don't like or when somebody challenges you 
and your perspective. So that's that's really the main thing that I would say. But then to black women, I would say you don't owe nobody a damn thing. Come on. You don't have to filter yourself. You don't have to get approval from anybody. Say what you say and say it with your chest. And if somebody don't like it too bad. And that's that. So that's the perspective that I bring. Whether I'm supported or not, I'm still going to say whatever the hell it is that I want to say. Whether I'm protected or not, I'm still going to say it and I'm still going to mean it. And I've had people who come to me and say, oh, you should apologize. And I tell them, hell no, I will absolutely not be doing that. I just well, so, I, yeah, I, I don't I don't see the point. I mean, yeah, I agree. I'm right there with you. So to be clear, yeah. and, I, and I think to your point, like I started off with, which is what really got my recentered my attention on you. And just mm-hmm. and then really just like the topic at hand, which is listening and believing black women is, yo, know, like all she did was just challenge a perspective like it. It didn't actually have to be the end. All, it's not the end all be all of anything. You said something. Yeah. Somebody else said something. You challenged something and you actually looked at something with criticality like that's those are those are healthy things that we need to do. And like I said, at the top of this, historically, it's been black women who have always challenged us. To, right. look, to look at things critically you know you think about you know tony morrison uh rest in peace uh, to the great she got critiqued all the time because she had critiques about black authors like there's no record of tony morrison calling like legendary black male authors bad writers she just simply had critiques on what they were writing about and she's like okay i don't agree with that or i'm not writing my content centered on white gays like if anything it'll be in the periphery we can exist outside of whiteness like it's okay Mm -hmm. but like she got so much shade for that it's it's top of mind for me uh, because i just got done watching this documentary so but the point is is, is, it was phenomenal Uh, but but the point is is like it's like man like like literally y'all push us to engage in the types of thinking that in every other space is applauded yet when it comes from black women it's a problem right and yeah. and so no, I just want to thank you again for I mean, you know. And can I can I be clear too? I said so many times, debate me. I said challenge me, and nobody has taken me up on it. You know, uh, with the exception of one person who I said I will debate. For instance, Kamala Harris's criminal justice record, and she wants to debate just this one super narrow topic. And then finally, she admits, "Oh well, I, I don't I don't know her record that much." Okay, well then there's no point in me debating. Okay, yeah, like what are we you, like what are we doing? Yeah, like okay, well then never mind, forget it. If you don't know, then you should have said that from the jump. Okay, well, you, know, hey, you know what? That's that's the other thing is. <laughs> Let me start with say this happens to black men and women and uh, right. non-binary folks as well. But like, and it seems especially black women when it comes to spaces of like specialty, mm-hmm. non-black women feel so empowered. It's majority, it's a lot of white folks, but other non just non-black women feel so empowered to like critique. Like, so it's like you know we had uh, Nicole Hannah Jones on a little while ago, right? And we were talking about just all these dumb critiques of the 1619 project by people who've never read a book okay right. they don't they can't even write right but they have these like super long-winded critiques about the uh, historicity or lack of academic mm-hmm. rigor in the work and it's like you're not even qualified like not and i'm not saying this in a snobby way i'm saying like right. you literally don't know what you're talking about but here you up here talking loud about how this trying to shut this black woman up and that kind of mm-hmm. that reminds me of what you just it, I, I go there because of what you just shared about look i'm willing to debate anybody on the merit of like the record and people are like oh actually i don't i don't know so it's okay so yeah. you shouldn't have been saying anything like why are you talking you know what i mean I, and i've offered to debate black people and eh? black people the killer mike and, and, and more people ice cube oh, no i didn't offer to debate ice cube it was you somebody not, else. I, I, was a, yeah. I said please don't please do not no it was a couple of people i killer mike comes to mind a couple of people that mm. i've that i've directly challenged yeah. And um, they don't take me up on it. And so I and I and I've always put out there, I, I can withstand any kind of scrutiny. I can understand any kind of critical lens right. um, if you're. But see, what people don't like is they don't like my delivery because I don't have deference towards them and I don't treat them like they are so much smarter than me because they're not right. and they don't know what they're talking about. But a lot of people don't really have the balls to to to, to go. <laughs> and I'm, so that's what I'm saying. I challenge people, but I'm about that life. If you want to challenge me too, it's not my fault that people haven't taken me up on. You know, it's funny. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, living corporate is a part of Westwood one. Now, one day I'm going to coordinate something where Ben Shapiro, uh, like, you know, all of my, I, I hit up my guests and I bring mm-hmm. in and we have like a, we do like, a, we do something. Cause like that would be good, you know, but a lot <laughs> of these, a lot of these spaces, not really about that life. You know, I wouldn't be, you know, it's, it's, it's a conversation for another day. But anyway, uh, Reese, before I let you go, where can folks 
find you? Where can folks learn about you? Uh, where can folks, you know, engage you? Uh, well, you can go to blackwomenviews.com and that's where all of my different social media is. I'm Black Women Views on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on YouTube. You can also find me on Rolla Martin Unfiltered every Thursday. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm around other than that. All right, y'all. Look, you, you heard it right here. Look, Black Women Views is going to be in the show notes. Rolla Martin Unfiltered every Thursday. Make sure you check it out. Uh, let's see here. What else before we get up out of here? Yes, look, live in corporate. Uh, real talk in the corporate world. We center and amplify black and brown perspectives in the workplace by having authentic conversations with black and brown and sometimes white. You know, what's up? Some, sometimes, you know, <laughs> you know, every now and then a couple of uh, Bucky's or White Wolves. A shout out to Marvel. Y'all know what I'm talking about. If you know, you know. Um, you know, we have them here too, but we're having authentic discussions, right? And it's every single week. You know, we're all over uh, Al Gore's internet. You just type in living corporate, living corporate corporate and we will pop up right living corporate is a playoff of living single we're not some capitalist machine okay it's living <laughs> single right so it's like you think about living corporate sometimes you got to re-baseline re and sometimes right. you do it at the end because you know whatever but i want to make sure people understand that you know that's when you hear the music at the top that da, 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 da. that's a sample from the living corporate and you know we're not that big so queen latifah has not sued us yet so uh, we're able to keep the sample for now. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, until next time, y'all, this has been Zach. You've been listening to Reese Cobra, CEO, founder of Black Women Views Media, uh, political pundit, commentator, and uh, regular recurring contributor on Roland Martin every Thursday. Till next time, y'all. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.